Firstly, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, this, uh, this conference is a great opportunity to be able to speak about the work of the fact-finding mission on Myanmar. Um, but what that really means is to speak about the people who have been affected by the actions of the Myanmar government, particularly the Myanmar military. And I'm in a, a, a very privileged position to be able to speak first because it gives me the opportunity of providing some of the context for what has happened, uh, the context in which many of the other speakers over these two days uh, will be talking in, in more specific detail about aspects of the Rohingya crisis. The United Nations Human Rights Council appointed our fact-finding mission two years ago and we provided <coughs> our detailed report, some 450 pages of it, in September last year. So almost a, a, a year has gone by since that report has been presented. I would like to speak a little about the background to the report, that is what we did, so that you have some understanding of the basis of our findings. Uh, second, I'd like to discuss what we actually found in relation to the Rohingya. Um, and third, and perhaps most importantly, since I'm a lawyer, I would like to talk about the legal implications of what we found and how accountability can be ensured. So that's a lot to cover in 25 minutes, but I'll do the best I can and uh, particularly be interested in having discussions with you over the next two days. Uh, as I said, the fact-finding mission was appointed two years ago. Um, we were appointed before the crisis of August 2017. Uh, in fact, we met in Geneva on the week commencing August 21, 2017, to commence our work. And we spent a whole week planning how we would tackle our assignment to look at human rights in Myanmar generally. Uh, at lunchtime on the Friday, the 25th of August, as we were about to finish our meeting, having successfully concluded our planning, <coughs> um, everything was thrown into disarray when we started receiving the first reports of what was happening in Northern Rakhine State. And of course, that overshadowed our work for the next year as we sought to respond to it. The fact-finding mission was not able to visit Myanmar itself. Um, we were banned by the government of Myanmar. But we had no shortage of people to speak to. Um, not only Rohingya people, but people from all the other ethnic minorities that over the years had been forced out of Myanmar and lived in exile in surrounding countries. Our staff conducted around 875 interviews with victims and eyewitnesses. Uh, 550 of those, Rohingya people in Cox's Bazaar and in Kuala Lumpur and Jakarta. Um, we also had over 250 interviews of secondary witnesses, um, academics, media, governmental representatives, UN and NGO representatives who had seen what was going on. We had access to an enormous quantity of satellite photographic and video imagery which, when verified, provided a validation of many of the eyewitness accounts that we had received. So although not permitted to enter Myanmar, and although the Myanmar government didn't speak to us, we had no shortage of evidence on which to rely. Our mandate dealt with Myanmar as a whole, but we focused on two specific areas, Rakhine State and the Kachin conflict in Kachin and North Shan states. And obviously for this conference, the situation of the Rohingya is the relevant one, so that will be my focus. Our investigation took its starting point as 2011-12. Um, we were to look at recent allegations of human rights violations and define recent as going back to that period. So far as the Rohingya is concerned, the date was selected because of the violence of 2012 occurring in June and October of that year. Uh, at the time, it was widely portrayed as intercommunal violence. We, however, considered that description inaccurate. Um, our finding was that this was not a spontaneous outburst of hostility, but rather the result of planning to instigate violence and amplify tensions. 
The planning was undertaken by a number of actors at that time. The amount of hate speech that led up to the June and October 2012 violence was quite extraordinary. Um, largely propagated by extremist Buddhist monk-led organisations, particularly Mabatha, um, also by Rakhine ethnic political parties, especially the Rakhine Nationalities Development Party, which on one occasion cited with approval the activities of Hitler and said that inhuman acts were sometimes necessary to maintain a race. We looked closely at the question of military involvement in the events of 2012 and found that the military were at least complicit. Um, our suspicion, unprovable to the standard that we adopted, the standard of reasonableness, but our suspicion was that the military, in collusion with many of the ethnic nationalist groups, were in fact the instigators of the violence. But certainly we had no difficulty in concluding that the portrayal of the violence of 2012 as intercommunal violence was inaccurate and grossly misrepresented the planning, strategizing and instigation of the violence that actually occurred in fact. The result of that violence was that 140,000 Rohingya people were displaced. Of those, 128,000 still live in IDP camps seven years later. We look next at the violence that occurred in October 2016. The events then were more of a surprise, um, instigated by a small number of amateurish attacks by an organisation that called itself the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army. Um, calling itself an army was a little bit of self-promotion, like many of these groups did. It was a fairly ragtag bunch <coughs> with, in 2016, no significant weaponry at all, and a very small number of people. Um, they were successful in capturing some weapons, maybe 100, 110 weapons from the police posts that they attacked. Um, some people tragically were killed, a small number of people. But perhaps the most significant lesson arising from 2016's <coughs> violence was what happened afterwards. Uh, it led immediately to a reinforcement of military and police presence in Northern Rakhine State um, and action taken against the domestic Rohingya population. Uh, police regularly went to Rohingya villages <coughs> and took away any serious <coughs> knives or farming implements that could be used as weapons. So machetes, for example, and sickles that were used in, in fields, these type of, um, of implements were removed leaving people with no more than kitchen knives you know, in their homes. Secondly, the military also required the removal of traditional fencing that Rohingya people use around their villages and between their family compounds. Uh, this permitted the police and the military to have open visibility into the villages and the compounds and also easy access uh, on a very rapid basis when entering villages and compounds. Then in early August 2017, two of the most notorious divisions of the Myanmar military, 33rd and 99th Light Infantry Divisions, were moved from Rakhine, uh, sorry, Kachin State into Northern Rakhine State. Uh, at the same time, around about the 8th of August, helicopter gunships were brought into the area for the first time. The, the relevance of this is that it indicates that at the very least, the military knew what was going to happen and were well prepared for it, at, at the very least. The attacks by ARSA of 25 August 2017 came as no surprise to the Tatmadaw, the military of Myanmar. They were ready, um, they had their strategies and their plans. Uh, it was not an occasion that led to an and a, a provoked outburst of spontaneous action on the part of the military. All was carefully orchestrated. We, we approach our task uh, with the attitude of 
of no assumptions. Um, we, as a fact-finding mission, were of the view that we needed to find the facts, and that meant assuming nothing. We did not assume the existence of ARSA. Um, we did not assume who, if they did exist, they might be. During the course of our investigations, we became satisfied that ARSA existed as an organisation led by some Rohingya people. We looked at the possibility of whether ARSA had been established by the military, and we could find no evidence of that. We considered whether some of the ARSA members were provocateurs planted by the military. We could find no evidence of that. But we are quite certain that the military had informants within ARSA and knew exactly, therefore, what was being planned and what was about to be executed. It was said that 30, around 30 security posts were attacked on the night of August 25, including police posts and one military camp. We were satisfied that there were 16 to 17 attacks. Uh, we could not find satisfactory evidence of the remainder. Um, but we were satisfied that there were 16 or 17 attacks. The nature of the attacks, though, needs to be taken into account. Clearly, across Northern Rakhine State, the number of people involved in the attacks would have gone into the high hundreds or low thousands. Um, the biggest estimate we've seen is 3,000 people. Um, but I suspect that that is probably an exaggeration, maybe more like 1,500 in total across the up to 30 attacks. The vast majority of these people were farmers and fishermen. It, it was men who did it, so I'm, I'm using fishermen technically. Um, they were untrained and they were largely unarmed. The, the only weapons, um, that is firearms, that appear to have been used in these attacks were those 100 to 110 weapons that had been captured from the police in the raids of October 2016. So this was largely an untrained, unarmed, undisciplined, uncommanded group of local people led by a handful of ARSA activists. Some of them said that they had been told by ARSA that when they launched the attack, there were all of these trained, well-armed ARSA divisions ready to come in behind them. Uh, of course, that didn't exist and it didn't happen. What followed those largely unarmed, uh, largely untrained people attacking up to 30 spots was an intensity of violence never before seen in Myanmar. Myanmar has a history, an unbroken history of violence for the last 70 years. But what happened over those following three or four months in Northern Rakhine State was without precedent in Myanmar for its intensity, for its widespread nature, and for the level of brutality. We examined intensively attacks on nine villages by the Tatmadaw. We verified attacks on another 54 sites. We had first-hand reports of attacks on a number of um, 22 other villages. We came to the conclusion that the estimate of at least 10,000 people killed was a conservative estimate. We were able to record through satellite imagery the destruction of over 37,000 Rohingya homes and structures, the total destruction of 392 villages. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees has established that over three quarters of a million people um, fled across the border into Bangladesh. This is the factual scale of what occurred during the months after 25 August 2017. Uh, those events occurred as a result of deliberate strategy. Uh, it was not unplanned, it was not a response to surprise attacks. Um, it was not the military just reacting. It was out of all proportion to the fairly minor attacks that had occurred on 25 8, uh, August, and the consequences have been extraordinary. Having found the facts, 
we sought to apply international law to them. We looked at the, the three principal categories of international law, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. So far as crimes against humanity were concerned, uh, it was not difficult to come quickly to the conclusion that there had been widespread crimes against humanity committed by the Tatmadaw in northern Rakhine State. Those crimes included murder, imprisonment, enforced disappearance, torture, rape, sexual slavery and other forms of sexual violence, persecution and enslavement. We also found extermination and deportation. We considered that there had been systematic oppression and discrimination sufficient to found a finding of persecution of the Rohingya people, um, itself a separate category in crimes against humanity. And we also said that the events may amount to the crime of apartheid. We found, most importantly, that the acts were committed as part of a widespread and systematic attack on a civilian population, uh, a key ingredient of crimes against humanity. The second category was war crimes. And this was a more difficult question. War crimes can only occur in a situation of armed conflict. Um, the armed conflict can be international or non-international. Certainly, many of these specific acts that constituted crimes against humanity also constituted war crimes if they occurred within the context of armed conflict. So the elements of murder, torture, cruel treatment, outrages on personal dignity, attacking civilians, displacing civilians, pillaging, attacking protected objects, taking hostages, sentencing or execution without due process, rape, sexual slavery, sexual violence, all of these acts would constitute a war crime if committed in the context of an armed conflict. The difficulty was whether we could classify what had occurred in Northern Rakhine State as an armed conflict. Did the, the fairly insignificant actions of ASA-led farmers and fishermen reach the level of violence to constitute an armed conflict? In the end, on balance, we said yes, from, from 25 August, but not before that. You know, before that, historically, the Rohingya people have been amongst the most peaceful ethnic minorities in Myanmar. You know, they, they have not had, since the early 1960s, um, any notable armed insurgency movement. Um, they have not been involved in the kind of violence that we see with the Pachin and the Shan and, and the Wa and, and others. Uh, we could not say that there was a situation of armed conflict before 25 August 2017. The International Committee of the Red Cross was satisfied that there was armed conflict after that, and in the end we were happy to rely on their expert assessment. They are the ones, the ICRC, responsible for the international war, uh, law of war, and we relied on their assessment. But for us, it was a difficult task to establish that there was a non-international armed conflict involving the Rohingya in northern Rakhine State. On balance, we found that, and so we found that war crimes had been committed by the soldiers at the Tatnador. And third, genocide, the most difficult question of all. Genocide is defined by its convention as any of the following acts committed to committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such. And then it lists five categories of act. Killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction, in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Having found facts, we had to examine each of those elements of the definition of genocide in turn. 
There was no difficulty in finding the Rohingya a protected group. Uh, it was a group defined by ethnicity and religion. Um, it was hard to argue it's defined by race. I, I don't know what a race is, I have to say. But ethnicity, yes, religion, yes, defined in those ways. And so a group that could claim protection under the Genocide Convention. We had no difficulty in finding that four out of the five prohibited categories of act had occurred in Northern Rakhine State. Of, of those five categories that I read out to you, the only one that we said was not occurring was the forcible transfer of children from the Rohingya people to another ethnic or religious group. Um, but four, the other four of the five, no question. Nor was there any question about the intent to commit those particular acts. Uh, as I said, it was very clear to us that this was well planned, well orchestrated, strategized, commanded, controlled, right from the beginning. The biggest question was the specific purposive intent associated with the law of genocide. And that is that all of this must not just have been intended, but in addition, committed with the intention to destroy in whole or in part a protected group. This, this specific intent is very difficult to find. Um, it, it's, not, it's not usual that somebody who's going to order a genocide will write out an order saying, I order you to commit the crime of genocide, signed Senior General Min on Line, Commander-in-Chief Patnador. You don't find that. You know, gen genocidal intent generally has to be found from surrounding circumstances. We said in our report that we had assessed the information, the facts that we had found, in light of the jurisprudence of international tribunals about the inference of this special intent. We found that the crimes in Rakhine State and the manner in which they were perpetrated were similar in nature, gravity and scope to those that have allowed international tribunals to find genocidal intent in other contexts. And particularly we're referring to the contexts of former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Jurisdiction of past tribunals has referred to five indicators by which this inference of genocidal intent can be drawn. They are, one, the broader oppressive context and hate rhetoric. Two, the specific utterances of commanders and direct perpetrators. Three, policies to exclude the protected group. Four, the level of organisation of the attacks indicating a plan of destruction and five, the extreme scale and brutality of the violence committed. When we examined the facts that we had found in relation to the Rohingya people, we found those five indicators of the intent to commit genocide as having been present in Rakhine State. We did so relying on jurisprudence in actual cases of found genocides by international criminal tribunals. We could not, in relation to genocide, because of the difficulty of this, this special purpose, allocate responsibility to individuals on a definitive basis. But we did say that six named generals should be prosecuted for the crime of genocide so that a court properly constituted could determine their individual guilt. But we had no difficulty in describing the nature of what had occurred in Rakhine State against the Rohingya people. Such serious crimes require accountability. There are two dimensions of accountability for these crimes. The first dimension is perhaps the one that occurs to us most easily. Victims are entitled to justice for what they have suffered. 
And justice means the perpetrators must be held accountable. That is a fundamental principle of law. The second dimension, however, is critical for Myanmar, not just the first. And the second dimension is that accountability is not just about the past, but also about the future. The Tatmadaw and its commanders have been committing war crimes and crimes against humanity for 70 years. There is no reason to expect that they will change their ways unless and until someone is held accountable. <laughs> accountability is about the future. It's about protecting people and preventing recurrence of this endless cycle of violence and brutality that the Tatmadaw has shown itself committed to. We examined accountability at national and international levels. Ideally, national judicial systems will handle such important crimes. And many states now have criminal laws, domestic criminal laws, dealing with these significant international crimes. In our view, it was impossible, it is impossible, to consider the domestic courts of Myanmar as capable of handling these crimes. Just not possible. Myanmar has not even a memory of an independent judiciary. It has been generations since there have been judges and lawyers who know what judicial independence means. It is beyond the capacity of the Myanmar courts and Myanmar judges to deal independently with these kinds of serious offences against the top leadership of the military who continue to dominate the country. So we recommended strongly the need for international accountability through proper international tribunals. We can talk, if you wish, on another occasion, later today or whenever, about methods of accountability, the International Criminal Court, specialist tribunals, the International Court of Justice. But what I do want to emphasise is that accountability is, is absolutely essential and accountability can only be found through international tribunals. My last point deals with the immediate priority. There's been mention already this morning about the Rohingya in the camps. You know, this is Kutupalo. The situation in the camps is absolutely appalling. But because there is so much open access to the camps, most of what we see in the media and hear in public debates is about the terrible conditions under which 1.2 million people are living in the camps in southeastern Bangladesh. Far worse and rarely reported is the condition of the remaining Rohingya in northern Rakhine state. And that is the greater priority even than the 1.2 million in the camps. The conditions in which they live have not changed at all. The condition of persecution remains. They have no freedom of movement. They have no access to fields and to fish for their own livelihood. They are dependent upon two international organisations bringing in food, which the Myanmar authorities turn on and off like a tap. Their kids have no education. They can't get health care. They are basically surrounded in urban ghettos, like Ongmingala in Sitwe, which are comparable to the ghettos in which Jews in Europe lived during the Nazi occupation. Or else they are in surrounded villages, unable to leave without written approvals from non-Rohingya Myanmar authorities, even to go to a hospital for health care. There is not the mass burnings, shootings that we have seen, and the forceful expulsions. That, that, from the period of August to December 2017, is not happening. But everything else is. There will be, and there cannot be, any return of people from Bangladesh until the situation of the Rohingya who are left is fixed, until the restrictions are lifted. There is no conception by which we can imagine safe, dignified return being possible if they have to return to these conditions. We don't know how many people are there. 
probably the best guess is four to five hundred thousand. Around 120,000 of those are in actual concentration camps. Let's call it for what it is. There are probably 10 or 20,000 in these urban ghettos. And the rest are living in surrounded villages from which they are unable to move without approval. You know, let, let's focus our first priority on fixing the situation of the Rohingya who are left. Until that happens, there's going to be no prospect of return no prospect of resolution. The, the crisis that we're discussing for these two days um, is not over. The mass expulsions may have stopped, and that's because the Tatmadaw has achieved its purpose. That there's no need to get rid of the rest when they are subjected to such enormous restrictions. The demographic makeup of Northern Rakhine State has been changed fundamentally. They've achieved their purpose, but the crisis is not over. Um, we need to look not just at how we deal with the crisis in terms of the past, accountability for crime, but how we deal with it in terms of the future, protecting people, restoring their rights, enabling them to live in dignity in Rakhine State. <laughs>